All right, welcome everyone. Um, we would like to start off with a land grant acknowledgement. Um, the UCLA Getty IDP acknowledges the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovang are, the Los Angeles Basin and Southern Channel Islands. As a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the Hanukbatam uh, uh, ancestors, Ahihirum elders, and Iohim Kem, our relatives and relations past, present, and emerging. Thank you all so much for being here today. We are really excited to welcome you to this month's Conservation Conversation. One Friday of every month, we will be inviting guests engaged with different roles within the broad conservation and cultural heritage preservation community to share their knowledge with us. Today, we are very excited to welcome the wonderful Malin Balseth, who will be speaking about the preservation of an intact 17th century warship performed at the Vasa Museum. Right. Okay. Um, so we would like to introduce Malin. Um, Malin Salset studied uh, at the Conservation of Cultural Property at Gothenburg University and has an MSc in Archaeological Science from Stockholm University uh, in 2000. Afterwards, she worked in the archaeological in archaeological conservation with a focus on the treatment of waterlogged wood and completed a research project on alum treated archaeological wood at the Swedish National Heritage Board from 2002 to 2009. She is currently the conservator at the uh, she's currently conservator at the Vassar Museum in Stockholm, Sweden. <laughs> um, here in the continuous effort to improve the long-term preservation conditions for 17th century warship Vasa and associated wooden artifacts, her work is concentrated on testing methods and implementing research results in the museum context. She also worked as a conservator in the research project Saving Augsburg at the, at the Cultural History Museum in Oslo, Norway, investigating the preservation status of and retreatment options for the alum treated wooden objects of the Viking Ship Museum collection. And with that, I will hand it over to Malin. Well, hello. <laughs> Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. And most of all, thanks for inviting me here. I'm, I'm particularly honored and humbled to be speaking to, um, and I hope with, emerging conservators, since it's uh, precisely this uh, transfer knowledge and um, exchange of generations that can fulfill our mission, I think, the, the long-term preservation of our common cultural heritage. So my name is Malin Salstedt, and um, being myself the, the second generation of conservators at the Vasa Museum in Stockholm, Sweden, I will talk to you about the, uh, the challenges and rewards of our specific mission, which is to preserve the wreck of near intact um, 17th century worship Vasa. So um, first, a bit of background and context here. Uh, the mighty warship Vasa capsized um, in Stockholm Harbor after only 1300 meters journey on her maiden voyage in um, August in 1628. Because the hull was underdimensioned uh, below the waterline in relation to how tall and heavily built the upper works were, Vasa had her central gravity too high above the water. And so it took only a gust of wind to make her heal so much that water was taken in through the, the gun ports that naturally stood open to, to show off all her heavy gun power. And she sank to the, to the seabed within minutes. When found and raised 333 years later in 1961, with her 60 meters in length and almost 12 meters in height, or bread width, and, and that's the stern castle at almost 20 meters height. Uh, the very size of this object and um, the scope of the project presented a, an unprecedented and monumental challenge of conservation. Um, and you can imagine perhaps seeing the, the picture to the left here uh, when she was being towed into the dry dock after her recovery. And perhaps in the right picture to get, give her more, more justice um, with set sails and splendidly painted as she would have been in this um, one to 10 uh, model uh, in front of the, the very impressive original in the enormous ship hall in the museum. Uh, 
Um, Vasa was exceptionally well preserved, both because she was newly built when she sank and she was predominantly a rot resisting oak. Uh, but also because she sank in Stockholm Harbor, used over time as the city dump um, and where the decay of waste on the one hand would um, cause high levels of sulfur compounds, but on the other hand, uh, reduce the oxygen levels which in turn limited the mi microbial degradation of Vasa's wood. Both the uh, water salinity and temperature are low too. And this keeps the, the ship degrading, um, uh, the wood degrading shipworm uh, away. Teredo navalis, it's a, a naval clam that lives off and, and completely destroys uh, wood in most marine environments. And you can see here um, the wooden piece, uh, the result of its presence. Um, and it's the same conditions of, of um, brackish and um, cool water that makes the entire Baltic Sea a unique marine archaeological archive. People have lived on the shores of the Baltic Sea since the Ice Age, that's about 10,000 years ago. And traces of their activity remain from Stone Age settlements to Viking uh, Age ship barriers uh, to remnants of ports and industries of more recent times. However, it's the, it's the wrecks of boats and ships that are the most well-known remains, being as they are like time capsules that can tell us about major historical events and individual human fates as well as about ship construction and objects in use during different periods of time. And in the Baltic Sea, one of the busiest seas in the world, thousands of these ships have ended up and been preserved. And many of these are yet to be discovered. However, on a scale invisible to the eye, Wood degradation takes place even in these waters. Microorganisms such as um, erosion and sulfur reducing bacteria degrade the cellulose component of the wood. The lignin structure is not affected. And as long as it's filled with water, the original dimensions and appearance of a wet wooden object will be intact. Uh, deceivingly well preserved, because if the object is dried without prior treatment, it shrinks and cracks and distorts. The more degraded, the greater the damage. And you can see a very clear example of this uh, in this picture, which shows the same piece of wood before and after drying, and where these drastic changes uh, occurred over a few days only after the removal from, from the wet environment. And so to avoid this, in, in wet wood conservation, a consolidant is introduced prior to drying, usually by impregnation, uh, to fill out for the degraded or lost cellulose and to strengthen remaining wood structure. As for the wood of Vasa, the outer approximately um, 20 millimeters of the timbers were affected by microbial degradation. And so a consolidant was needed to prevent shrinkage and to provide support during and after drying. The methods that were used at the time um, had given unreliable and even damaging results, so new options had to be investigated. A number of consolidants were tested on large oak panels of similar age and preservation status as the Vasa oak. And one of these consolidants was PEG, which is short for polyethylene glycol. And it's a polymer um, that had previously been used by the wood industry to prevent cracking when drying out fresh wood. The PEG had also been used small scale in conservation of wet wooden objects. Um, and in fact, it had a patent for this application from 1952. Now, these tests concluded that PEG gave the best penetration into the wood, 
and uh, with satisfactory results uh, when testing the peg on a number of smaller objects from the VASA context, this was the, the consolidation agent chosen to use for the conservation for the ship too. Um, a peg is a synthetic wax. It's easily dissolved in water. Uh, it's non-harmful to either man or environment. And it's commonly used in medical and cosmetic products, for example. Chemically, it's a polymer where the length of the molecule chain gives different uh, properties and appl applicability. Um, for example, a lower molecular weight peg, like peg 600, is a liquid in room temperature, whereas peg 1500 um, is a solid. And these different properties could be used in the treatment uh, of the ship, where peg uh, 4000, 1500, and 600 were all applied over the course of the treatment process. And, and here, the, the higher molecular weights will, would give support, whereas the lower molecular weights would, would penetrate better. The application was done um, through an automated spraying system and um, um, went on for 17 years. The PEG solutions were collected in a tank beneath the ship and reused, recirculated over the ship. And though this was an uh, economic advantage, um, pollutants like sulfur and iron would in this way be efficiently spread to all of the wood. And this later had uh, unforeseen and unwelcome consequences. And I will get back to that. Testing of, of um, various pegs and different concentrations continued parallel to the ongoing treatment and adjustments were, were made according to the results. And, and this was an extensive and groundbreaking work done by the first generation conservator at the museum, Birgitta Hofors. And it's the, the, described in detail in her dissertation from 2010. The understanding of peg impregnation as a conservation method for wet wood is largely based on this pioneering work. And the method is, uh, with some modifications, still in very common use today. Controlled air drying then took place over almost 10 years, where the relative humidity was lowered from 90 to 60 percent. And then a surface treatment with PEG 4000 was applied by heat to the outer surfaces of the ship and the two um, upper decks. And this was as a protective layer. So almost 30 years then after her, her racing, Rosa was towed into the newly built and purpose-built museum. Uh, and a climate uh, system was installed, dimensioned at 600,000 visitors per year, which was the expected number. By the opening of the museum in 1990, the conservation work was considered to be a finalized project and focus turned fully on public activities. This meant that the conservation uh, facilities and labs were gradually downsized and also that the preservation staff were reduced down to um, one conservator and one technician by the end of the 1990s. The museum was an instant success with the public. The expected visitor number of 600,000 visitors per year was exceeded immediately, with about 30% during the first decade. And since 2007, we've had a million visitors per year. And uh, the last three years, uh, peaking at 1.5 million visitors uh, before the pandemic hit then in 
with the visiting numbers immediately exceeding what was expected and indeed what the climate system was dimensioned for, the system had to run at maximum capacity too often and the set climate specifications of 50, 70, 60% RH and 17 to 20 degrees Celsius were regularly passed. And you can see here one example from July 2003, with RH fluctuating from 65 to well above 70, and uh, the temperature from 25 to 25 degrees Celsius every 24 hours. So seeing the conservation as something finished turned out to be a great mistake. Because towards the end of the 1990s, signs of ongoing degradation processes in the shape of yellow and white precipitations were appearing and gradually increasing on the surfaces of the ship. With low pH values, these precipitations clearly stressed the wood chemically, but also mechanically in bad cases causing losses of surface material um, and you see here one of the, the more severe examples of this. Now, these surfaces often hold significant archaeological information, such as pigments or workwear or owner's marks, for example. So this also meant an irretrievable loss of archaeological evidence. The alarming situation called for action, and with the help of international expertise, in 2003, the museum initiated the first in a series of research projects. And naturally, with the, the initial focus on the uh, nature and causes of these precipitations. The humidity, humidity fluctuations in the museum and a corresponding transport of water in and out of the timbers had drawn chemicals in the wood out to deposit at the surface as various hydrated iron sulfates, gypsum and elemental sulfur. And here the, the iron mainly originates from the more than 5,000 bolts that had originally held the ship together, but fully corroded and diffused into the wood during burial time. And the sulfur coming from the highly uh, contaminated water of Stockholm Harbor. So the, the research into Vasa's wood has been running in parallel with um, varying intensity and shifting focus. But to stop further development of precipitations and slow down any ongoing degradation processes, uh, a number of actions were also taken in museum practice. And the first until today, the most important and effective measure was the upgrading of the climate system. It came online in July 2004 with new specifications set to RH 55 plus minus 4% and temperature at 18.5 plus minus 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius. And as you see here in the diagram that the curve stabilized almost instantly and the, the system has been running so well, in fact, that, that um, the museum RH in reality is stable around 53 plus minus 2% RH. But we still have a, a slightly wider spread in the summer months where we have the visitor numbers peaking and also the outside temperature is higher. The, fact, the effects in terms of preservation followed where the formation of precipitation ceased and the structural deformation of the ship showed a clear decrease. Apart from monitoring climate, we are monitoring changes in Vasa, both structural changes and chemical changes at the surface by controlling precipitation formation and pH. As for the structure monitoring, since the year 2000, uh, geodetic measurements uh, of 350 positions uh, outside the ship and 50 positions on board have been made twice a year, and this enables us to follow deformation over time. 
Uh, Vasa is settling downwards with about one millimeter per year, but there are also local deformations. Trend breaks could be seen after the climate was stabilized and also after other measures were taken to improve existing support. The monitoring of the precipitations can by no means give us the full picture of chemical change, but it does tell us that this particular process has ceased since we see no new precipitations and uh, pH is generally stable if somewhat low in existing ones. A more urgent concern is the chemistry deeper in the timbers and the effect it has on the mechanical properties of the wood. So the continuation of the preservation research is, is a measure in itself. Over time, focus shifted from the phenomena at the surface to the status of the wood deeper in the timbers where concerningly low pH values were found too, in combination with high levels of iron uh, affected cellulose and reduced mechanical properties. And these findings are of great importance with regards to the structural stability of the ship, not the least in view of the next major preservation project at the museum, which is to improve the support for the ship. And here we need to know the mechanical properties of Vasa's timbers as they are today, but also we need to be able to make qualified predictions about future properties. The studying the effects that the chemical changes have on various mechanical properties is crucial, as is finding the weight of these changes. And like I mentioned, that the high presence of iron in Vasa's wood is mainly the result of the thousands of bolts that, of wrought iron that originally held the ship together, but completely corroded away over the years in burial. In order to raise the ship in the 1960s, new bolts were inserted in the old bolt holes. However, corrosion affected these bolts too, sitting as they were in the highly corrosive environment of water, peg and acid development in the wood. Um, and this was during the conservation treatment, uh, during the drying phase and, and even in the museum before the climate was stabilized. Uh, and you see top second to the right, um, um, an example of what these Corroding, corroded bolts from the 1960s uh, look like when, we, when they are removed from the ship. This was not only a, a new potential source of unwanted iron, but more importantly, uh, the corroding surfaces of the bolts in combination with a slight shrinkage of the wood as it dried, meant that the friction between the bolt and the wood was reduced. And with that, the, the function of holding the various construction timbers together, and so affecting the stiffness of the entire ship. In 2008, a new bolt was therefore designed and developed by our engineer and our shipwrights in cooperation with the Swedish steel manufacturing company, Sandvik AB, whose specialists provided expertise but also a stainless steel produced to withstand particularly demanding environments, such as in offshore oil plants, for example, and possibly as demanding Vasa's wood. As seen in the picture, the bolt is designed as a rod in a tube, and this is in order to reduce material and weight. It has a spring at each end, which gives um, a constant pressure and this can be measured and adjusted if needed. For the gentlest possible removal and replacement of the 1960s bolts uh, and um, with the new bolts, a special extractor tool was also developed, uh, a type of motorized screw jack that you can see in action here. Um, which could both pull the old bolt out and pull the new one in. The vast majority of the practical work was done over seven years, with about 80% of the old bolts exchanged. 
And with an average weight of three kilos for the 1960s bolts, as compared to 1.6 kilos for the new one, uh, with the replacement then of around um, 5,000 bolts, some seven tons of weight is estimated to have been removed from the hull. So with the um, um, hull stiffness improved, focus is now on improving the support for the ship. While the peg treatment was indeed successful in preventing shrinkage and distortion, it has also given unwanted properties to the wood in serving as a plasticizer, clearly affecting deformation rate, for example. With a weight of about, about 900 tons, the ship is still in the same support cradle she was placed in in the 1960s. And even if additions have been made over the years to improve the support, um, the, uh, the support is still, still not fully adequate. A gradual set, settling downwards and a shifting to port can be seen in the geodetic monitoring. And local deformations can be seen even by the naked eye in some places. So the number one priority at museum is to dimension, construct, and put in place a new support that will redistribute the loads of the ship. Uh, seen in the uh, cross section to the right, the loads from the heavy oak decks will be led away from the ship by connecting an inner support with outer supports. The joint support around the keel will enable an uprighting of the ship, which today is leaning about 1.5 degrees to port. However, the most significant improvement will be the positioning of the outer support cradles in correlation with the ship's own construction under Vasa's so-called beam stacks. And this is where the, the heaviest uh, internal supporting timbers are concentrated, such as the ship beams, riders, and knees. And you can see examples of these in the longitudinal section. The greatest loads will in this way be spread and supported di more directly, uh, minimizing future deformation and crack formation and maintaining the, the shape of the ship as a whole. Another current project is the creation of a digital preservation management tool to aid in the documentation and visualization of various changes in the ship over time. This means linking a wide range of existing information, both archeological and preservation related, to geographic positions on the ship in a photogrammetry based 3D model. We are able to withdraw and visualize existing information, such as, for example, what objects were found in the Admiral's cabin, or uh, as in this picture, get an overview of the positions and pH values of the precipitations in the hold of the ship. We can also digitize new information by registering data straight into the model. For instance, when controlling the precipitations, adding photos and pH values and showing the change over time in these positions. In the future, we hope to be able to include more factors affecting losses preservation, such as data from the climate system and maybe even the new support so that potential patterns or correlations can be found and, and um, we can take measures accordingly. The model will also serve public and educational purposes by web access and search functions and augmented reality applications, for example. And if you're interested, uh, do follow the, the slow, very slow at the moment, but steady development of, of the model at Sketchfab. And here you can also find uh, models of other shipwrecks in situ in the Baltic Sea. So in closing, I would like to share some reflections. 
Like I hope I have been able to convey, one thing that Vasa's preservation history has shown is the importance of the long-term perspective, not only on the preservation itself, but on the competence required to perform that preservation, both strategically and practically. Conservation, of course, is not something that is finished, but a continuous process with a constant improvement of the preservation conditions for each particular piece of cultural heritage. And for the preservation of Vasa, close cooperation and understanding between a wide range of professionals, both within and outside of the museum, have been key. In addressing both research questions and museum practice issues, a multidisciplinary approach is needed. Wood specialists from various fields, such as chemistry, biology, engineering, carpentry, and uh, archaeology and conservation, must work together and while they're probing their specific topic, keep eyes on overall solutions that are applicable in the museum context. So the securing and maintaining of multidisciplinary competence needs the same long-term perspective as Basel's preservation. And with that corresponding predictable and reliable funding for preservation management measures and research. Being the first and the largest marine archaeological wooden structure to be conserved and preserved has come with both challenges and rewards. Without knowledge or experience from others to follow, the first generation conservators bravely stepped into the unknown, testing new techniques, materials and methods. And this is something we still need to do today. But this has also enabled development and funding of major research projects that our field might not have accessed otherwise. In this way, both experience and research-based results have made critical contributions to the advancement of our discipline and sharing the knowledge. And um, with that, including the bad lessons that we have learned is, is certainly one of the more rewarding parts of our work. This includes not the least the knowledge around the use of PEG, where the conservation of ships that followed could be improved from the experience made uh, in Vasa's treatment. Like for ex the example, the importance of keeping solutions clean and not heated, since both these factors may uh, cause PEG degradation. Also to apply uh, the various peg, peg grades in the right order with the smaller molecules first. And, and this may it seem very obvious, but it was in fact not done in the Vasa case. The impact of peg on the mechanical properties of wood is further new knowledge coming from the Vasa example and another field of interest and relevance for current and coming ship preservation projects. So even if we still often are forced to tread new ground, as the second generation conservators, we have the previous generation to collect knowledge and not the least inspiration from. The fossil preservation project is and must be an ever ongoing process, carefully handed over from one generation to the next. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Um, see if I can stop sharing now. <laughs>